and welcome to From the EBPL Archives, Encore Presentations from the East Brunswick Public Library. I am your host, Melissa Hozik. This event was presented as part of our Just for the Health of It initiative. Just for the Health of It is a proprietary health literacy program developed by the East Brunswick Public Library to promote health literacy in Middlesex County. To learn more, visit justforthehealthofit.org. Now, enjoy the program. Welcome, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for today's Astera Cancer class, Side Effects of Cancer Therapies. My name is Kathy Chern, and I am a consumer health librarian at East Brunswick Public Library. Today's program is brought to you by Astera Cancer Care and the Libraries Just for the Health of It initiative to promote community health and wellness. Our speaker today is Dr. Robert Fine, medical oncologist and hematologist. Please be aware that this talk is being recorded. Please keep your microphones muted and your webcams off. When ready, the recording will be available for viewing at ebpl.org slash YouTube. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. Our speaker will answer questions at the end of the talk. Please be aware that our speaker cannot provide medical advice to attendees during this program. And without further ado, I'll turn things over to Dr. Fine. Okay, thank you, Kathy. So um, for those who don't know me, my name is Dr. Robert Fine. <clears throat> I'm a medical oncologist and hematologist. Um, I want to put my picture there. Let me see if I can get rid of that. Um, good. Um, so I'm a medical oncologist and hematologist um, in New Brunswick and in Monroe. Um, I've been in um, practice now for about 35 years. Um, I go to Robert Wood Johnson and St. Peter's Hospital, and I'm currently the Chief of Hematology Oncology at St. Peter's. Um, I am a member of Astera Cancer Care, and we're a large hematology and oncology um, group um, in the area. We have offices in East Brunswick, Monroe, um, Somerset, Edison, and in Somerville, as well as Hamilton. So today I'm going to be speaking about chemotherapy, um, side effects, and um, some ways to lessen those side effects. I have a lot of slides that I'm going to go through, and I'm going to try to also talk about side effects of hormonal therapy as well as immunotherapy. Um, these are the newer ways that we're treating cancer. And I thought it was really important to discuss this because there's so much fear and um, apprehension and misconceptions about chemotherapy and about side effects. But the reality today in the year 2021 is much different than it was in past years. And this is not only because we have better drugs, um, safer drugs, drugs that have less side effects, but we also have some terrific medicines that we use to prevent side effects from these uh, medications. We also have new treatments that we're giving not only traditional chemotherapy, but immunotherapy, hormonal therapy, and many of these drugs were designed not only to work better, but to minimize the amount of side effects and make treatment much safer and much more, much better tolerated. So to begin, next slide, please. So first I'm gonna talk about chemotherapy. And this is a very busy slide. But basically, chemotherapy is the use of chemicals, chemotherapy, chemical therapy, or drugs that we use to treat cancer. Um, there are many, many different types of chemotherapy drugs that we use. And the main um, factor that ties all these drugs together is that they, in general, kill rapidly growing cells. Cancer cells are generally much more rapidly growing than normal cells. So because they're growing rap more rapidly, we have targeted drugs, chemotherapy drugs, to target this rapid growth. And some of the drugs that we use are called alkylating agents. And these are drugs that work primarily by causing damage to the DNA in the cancer cell. We also have anti-metabolites, and those are various drugs that we use that affect both DNA and RNA. Um, and many of you hear about RNA now, which is unrelated to this, but many of the new COVID vaccines are RNA vaccines. Um, and again, this has nothing to do with, with chemotherapy drugs, but the anti-metabolite drugs affect both DNA and RNA. 
Um, a mainstay of cancer therapy is a drug called anthracyclines or adriamycin donorubicin. And these are drugs that affect DNA replication, which happens during cell division while the cells are dividing. Um, we have other drugs that called mitotic inhibitors. And these drugs that actually affect the way that the cells split, the little spindle that causes the cells to split during mitosis. And there are other drugs that we use that aren't traditional chemotherapy drugs that are frequently used to treat cancer, such as steroids or corticosteroids. Um, and these are used not only to treat the side effects of chemotherapy, but they're frequently used to treat um, the cancer um, the, itself. Um, so we, um, so there are many different drugs that we use. We use them singly and we use them in combination as well. And the side effects that we get really depend on which drug we're using and in which combination. Um, so next slide, please. <clears throat> so because chemotherapy drugs, again, work by killing rapidly growing cells, they frequently can't distinguish between which normal cells are rapidly growing and which cells are not rapidly growing. And that's why we get many side effects from chemotherapy, just because the drugs can't differentiate normal cells from cancer cells. So typically the side effects that people get from chemotherapy drugs are from related to the cells that are growing rapidly normally in the body. And the cells that grow most rapidly are the cells that are in the bone marrow. So if chemotherapy is affecting the rapidly growing cells in the bone marrow, people tend to become anemic. Um, their white cell count can go low, where it's down lower in the slide where it says low white blood cell count. And it can also drop the platelets, which make um, the blood clot, the cells that cause clotting. So chemotherapy, again, typically does cause low blood counts. And we call that cytopenia, anemia, thrombocytopenia or leukopenia that can lead to being fatigued from anemia, can increase the risk of an infection if the white cell count is low and increase the risk of bleeding. Um, the cells that also grow rapidly are cells that line the GI tract. And that's why people frequently will get some diarrhea, which is listed there. Um, the cells that also grow rapidly normally in the body are the cells that line the oral cavity or the, oso or the esophagus. So people will frequently have sores in the mouth, and we call that mucositis, difficulty swallowing, we call that dysphagia. Um, and, and I'll get more specifically about these things in, in a bit. Um, also, the, the, your hair follicle grows rapidly, and that's why certain chemotherapy drugs affect the hair follicle, and that's why with many chemotherapy drugs, people get hair loss. Other effects that people can get that may not be related to the cells growing rapidly could be constipation. And this sometimes does happen from chemotherapy, but actually it happens more often from the anti-nausea medicines that we give people to treat the side effects of chemotherapy. Um, people frequently are fatigued from chemotherapy. They can have fluid retention um, um, or some swelling. Many people complain of some difficulty thinking or chemo brain or chemo fog. Um, some people will get neuropathy, and that's common with certain drugs where they get tingling in the fingertips and toes. Um, and that doesn't happen with all chemotherapy drugs, but it does happen with some. And as I'll discuss a bit later on, certain of the chemotherapy drugs can affect the heart, the pumping mechanism of the heart, causing um, congestive heart failure or fluid retention. Um, okay, next slide, please. And so there are some immediate side effects of chemotherapy, and these are generally things that happen within the first several hours or day that you get chemotherapy. Um, so these are immediate side effects. Um, and the most common thing that people are aware of is nausea and vomiting. Um, this can happen frequently, and it happens actually for two reasons. One is sometimes the chemotherapy drugs can directly affect the, the stomach and the intestinal tract, causing um, the body to just try to get rid of these drugs, even if they're intravenous, that can cause contraction of the stomach or intestinal spasm that can lead to nausea. Um, but people frequently will get nausea and vomiting, not because of effective chemotherapy drug on the intestinal tract, 
but the effects of the chemotherapy drugs and chemotherapy centers in the brain. Um, so when we come up with medication to treat nausea and vomiting from chemotherapy, we want to affect the brain chemotherapy or nausea and vomiting center, as well as the intestinal tract. And that's what those drugs are affected. Um, that's how those drugs work, to try to uh, decrease nausea and vomiting. Um, chemotherapy can also cause um, loss of appetite. And sometimes people get the drug, so they just really don't feel like eating you know, that day or the next day. People can also get diarrhea and constipation, and that can be caused by the effects of the drugs on the intestinal tract. Um, it can also be caused by the effects of the anti-nausea drugs on the intestinal tract, leading to some diarrhea or constipation. Um, and these are effects that people kind of get right away from chemotherapy, and people are most upset by nausea and vomiting that they get right away. Um, uh, next slide, please. There's also delayed effects of chemotherapy, and people can have delayed nausea and vomiting, and that sometimes can happen two, three, four days after chemotherapy. And that's common in not all chemotherapy drugs, but certain drugs that may not cause much nausea the day you get treated, but may lead to nausea and vomiting two or three days later. A big problem with chemotherapy is what's called um, anticipatory nausea. And that's where people expect to have nausea and vomiting. So it's a, it's a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that even if they're really not that sick from the drugs they're getting, just the thought of getting chemotherapy makes people sick. And certain drugs may help um, prevent that, particularly drugs um, that cause some calming effects like um, Valium or Ativan, which are particularly good for that anticipatory nausea. Um, many people who have had chemotherapy in the past and were cured of their cancer, um, you know, years later will come back to the doctor's office and as soon as they walk into the building, um, the smell of the building or the thought of coming into the building caused them to be nauseous, even though they haven't had chemotherapy in years. <clears throat> many people from chemotherapy also get fatigued. They have no energy and feel very tired. Um, and this could be caused both by being anemic or low blood counts from the chemo. Just frequently, the drugs themselves can also cause people to be fatigued. Next slide, please. And there are some later side effects of chemotherapy. And one is mouth sores. And again, the mouth sores people get are from chemotherapy affecting the cells that are growing rapidly in the oral cavity um, to protect the membranes of the mouth normally from foods that we eat and virus and, um, and acid foods and things like that. But that doesn't usually show up until about five to seven days after the chemotherapy treatment. Um, people can get hair loss, which I'm going to talk about more in a few minutes, but people generally don't begin to get hair loss from chemotherapy for about 10 to 14 days after the, the treatment. Um, it doesn't happen sooner and it doesn't happen with all drugs. There's really just a very select group of drugs that actually cause hair loss. Um, and again, many new drugs and particularly many of the new chemotherapy drugs, the newer chemotherapy drugs do not cause hair loss. And later side effects of chemotherapy could be malnutrition or dehydration. People aren't feeling well, they're not eating, they're not drinking enough fluids, they're not drinking enough fluids. And you know, five, seven days later, you can get some dehyd dehydration where you feel very weak, very tired, your blood pressure could drop, um, could be lightheaded, could be dizzy. And that could be a serious problem um, because if people are dehydrated for a while, um, it could also affect the kidneys and people can develop kidney problems not so much from the chemotherapy drugs themselves, but from the dehydration that may develop because of not eating or drinking adequately. Um, next slide, please. So when we're giving people chemotherapy drugs or any kind of treatment, um, we really want to assess what kind of status these people have, what their condition is, so we can kind of know how much toxicity they're having, how sick are they, how, how much of a problem it's causing, and we want to have some way of standardizing that from one person to the other. So we've developed over the years a performance status for patients where we can kind of grade patients in, term, in terms of how they're doing overall, not in terms of responding to cancer, but what their overall medical 
and physical condition is. And the status that scale that we use mainly is called the Karnofsky scale. There's another scale called the ECOG scale or the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group. Um, but most people use the Karnofsky scale. And this was actually named after Dr. David Karnofsky, who was one of the, um, the founding fathers of medical oncology. And he was at Sloan Kettering in the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s. Um, I did my fellowship at um, Sloan Kettering, and there was a Karnofsky library there where we had many of our, the fellows had many of our meetings and conferences. And to show you how things change, this was an oil painting of Dr. Karnofsky over the head of the table. And it was one of those pictures that I'm sure you all recognize where someone was sitting there with their elbow on the table holding a cigarette in their hand um, with smoke billowing around them. And that's how people did oil paintings back then. Um, and unfortunately, Dr. Karnofsky was a cigarette smoker and he died of lung cancer in the late 1960s. Um, but when we use this Karnofsky scale, uh, someone who has a Karnofsky status of 100 is normal um, if they have. And then the numbers go down depending on whether they're able to care for themselves or what kind of condition they're in. So say someone had a Karnofsky scale of 70, they're able to care for themselves, they can, but they can't really carry on with normal activity. So they may be at home, you know, taking care of themselves, but not able to go to work. A Karnofsky scale of 50, they, people may require assistance. Um, a Karnofsky scale of 30, people are severely disabled. And the scale goes down until people obviously can't do anything and they're no longer alive. Um, but this is a way that we measure people's overall status to see what their condition is and whether they're really in condition to get chemotherapy or to get any kind of treatment, depending on what their overall status is. Um, and this is also how we rate the side effects of chemotherapy as well. Next slide, please. So we talk about medical management and how we manage the side effects of chemotherapy. Um, and the main way that we can try to manage the side effects of chemotherapy is by changing the cycle we give chemotherapy. And as you all know, some people get chemotherapy once a week. Some people get chemotherapy once every other week. Sometimes it's once every three weeks. Sometimes it's two days in a row every month. And this is called the cycle. And the cycles are developed from trials that have been done using these drugs, medical trials, you know, over the past many decades, where we've really been able to analyze when the side effects develop, um, how severe the side effects are in general of particular drugs. So we have been able to come up with a general scheme of how we give the treatments, um, what's the optimal way of treating people to minimize the amount of side effects they may get. So this would minimize side effects. It also depends on the number of drugs that were being used. Are they getting two chemotherapy drugs, three chemotherapy drugs, or one type of drug? Also the type of cancer in the stage and also the goals of treatment. Some people with cancer, we're giving chemotherapy in an effort to cure them. We know that these drugs will cure the patient. And if we can cure a patient, we obviously want to give the correct dose of treatment the maximum amount, we don't want to skimp on treatment. We want to give the maximum amount of treatment that we can give that's both, both safe and well tolerated in order to, to cure these people. Um, but we don't obviously want to give toward, toward side effects. But if our goal is not to cure someone, if it's to control their symptoms, shrink the cancer down, improve their sense of well being, we would want to give maybe less drugs or give the drugs less often or give smaller doses of drugs or give drugs that have less side effects because that our goal may not be to cure someone, but would be to make them feel better. So we want to use our knowledge of these drugs to give the drugs in an effective manner, but to give them the, um, a lesser amount or a lesser schedule um, so we don't cause more harm than good. Um, Next slide, please. So the, obviously the concern that many people have and what people express the most fear about is nausea and vomiting. And again, not all chemotherapy drugs cause nausea, many do. But fortunately nowadays we have terrific anti-nausea medicines, which I'll discuss on the next slide, that prevents nausea and vomiting in almost everybody. And as you can see from the slide, which is a little bit hard to read, 
the ri risk factors for people getting nausea and vomiting, and the, the abbreviation for that is chemo-induced nausea and vomiting, or CINV, are several things. One's the type of drugs we're giving, but other factors are related to that as well. Um, one is the previous episodes of nausea and vomiting. People that have had ten, that have had nausea and vomiting from prior drugs tend to have more nausea and vomiting with subsequent treatment, again, frequently because of that anticipatory nausea and vomiting. People that are younger, less than 50 years age, tend to have more nausea and vomiting. Women, for some reason, tend to have more nausea and vomiting than men do. However, if people have been, women have been pregnant and have had severe nausea and vomiting, where pregnancy induced um, severe nausea and vomiting, they tend to get a little bit sick with chemotherapy as well. People that have a history of motion sickness um, tend to have more nausea and vomiting. Um, people that are actually alcoholics um, that drink heavily, they tend to have much less nausea and vomiting. And I guess that makes sense because if you can't tolerate alcohol and it makes you sick, you're not going to drink alcohol. But if you can drink a lot and you tolerate it, you're going to tolerate chemotherapy better as well. And again, the bottom part of the slide is certain drugs are more likely to cause nausea and vomiting. Certain drugs are less likely to cause nausea and vomiting. So when we're combining chemotherapy drugs, um, we may want to combine one drug that causes more nausea and vomiting with one drug that causes less. So we can give more, a bigger dose of either of those drugs, get better effect from either of those drugs without getting overlapping or combined or synergistic side effects. Um, and just to going to the middle part of the slide, even though we have many anti-nausea medicines that work well, frequently things that work well are not medications, but things such as drinking more water. Ginger ale really does help people. Um, relaxation techniques can help people. Um, hypnosis frequently does help people. Acupuncture can help people with nausea and vomiting. And frequently, things as simple as eating a cracker or having antacids such as Tums, Rolaids, or Mylanta can help. Uh, next slide, please. So just like we had that Karnofsky scale for grading people's overall well-being and status in regards to the cancer, we also have scales for grading side effects of treatment. So this is the graph that we, the slide that we use to grading the amount of nausea and vomiting that people have. And we generally grade, grade it with grade one, two, three, and four. Grade one would be minimal um, nausea vomiting. Um, and usually that doesn't affect um, um, much people's sense of well-being. They're able to eat. And generally, we don't need to give much treatment. Grade two is more severe. They may have a little weight loss, sometimes um, difficulty eating, and those people would require um, um, more medication to treat the nausea and vomiting and maybe even require intravenous fluids in the office. And again, as it gets more severe, people may require hospitalization, IV fluids, intravenous feeding, that's called TPN. But honestly, nowadays with the modern anti-nausea medicines we have, it is actually rare and Truly, it's rare for people to require hospitalization for nausea and vomiting. Most people getting chemotherapy nowadays do perfectly fine, maybe a little queasiness, maybe a little nausea, but rarely is it more than that. Um, next slide, please. So this is just looking at the various types of nausea and vomiting. And again, um, anticipatory nausea is the first type, and that's what people expect to get sick. It's a condition response. And that happens in about 25 to 50 percent of people. Acute nausea and vomiting generally happens within five to six hours after the first treatment. Delayed treatment, as I said, nausea and vomiting generally is within a week. Um, and rarely people can have a refractory where it just happens at any time. Um, next slide, please. And this is kind of a busy slide as well. Um, but you can see that there's various types of anti-nausea medicine. The first anti-nausea medicine that really proved to be effective was andosterone, and the brand name for that is Zofran, and that was first diagnosed, uh, first, I guess, first invented about um, 35 years ago, um, and that was really a breakthrough. Um, and that medicine, Zofran or andosterone, which is now intravenously or oral, 
had really served to prevent nausea and vomiting in almost everybody. It's a terrific anti-nausea medicine, and this enabled us to start giving fairly tough chemotherapy that used to require hospitalization, even to give the drugs, to give these drugs as an outpatient. Um, side effects of Zofran are minimal. Um, people sometimes get constipated from that. Um, the other medicines that are listed there are Kytrol, Aloxy, Amend, and these are just different drugs that have different mechanisms of actions that have de been developed over the years, but still Zofran is really the mainstay. Next slide, please. Other drugs that we may use besides the specific anti nausea drugs that I just mentioned could be drugs that work different ways. In the middle of the slide, there's a drug called prochlorperazine. Um, that's an old anti-nausea medicine, that's compazine, and that works very well also. Um, the drug above that is dexamethasone, those are steroids, and steroids are used not only to treat people for, the, for cancer occasionally, particularly breast cancer, as well as other cancers and leukemias and lymphomas, but dexamethasone or other steroids works beautifully as an anti-nausea medicine. The top drug is Haldol, and Haldol is a um, sedative that we give sometimes to people that have severe nausea and vomiting. We also give medicines such as Ativan um, or Valium for anticipatory nausea and vomiting. Um, and towards the bottom of the slide, um, the, that's um, 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 marijuana. Marijuana works well for nausea and vomiting. I mean, now it's legal in New Jersey, which is good. We also have Marinol pills, which have been legal for probably about 10 years, which is quite good both for nausea and vomiting and also stimulating people's appetite. And the last drug there, uh, di di dibenhydramine, is Benadryl, and Benadryl also works. So we have many drugs in our arsenal um, that we work beautifully, again, to prevent nausea and vomiting in almost everybody. Again, it's a rare person who has more than a little bit of nausea and vomiting. Next slide, please. The other big complication of chemotherapy is low blood counts. And low white blood cell count is called neutropenia. Um, and that's a serious complication because if people's low white blood cell counts go low, um, people are much more susceptible to an infection. And years ago, if people had low blood counts, people were admitted to the hospital needing an antibiotics. And years ago, when we gave chemotherapy, the adage was that if you weren't causing four to five percent of your patients to be admitted to the hospital, with an overwhelmingly serious infection or sepsis, you were not giving adequate doses of chemotherapy. And again, that's a thing of the past also because of medicines that we've developed to prevent the blood counts from going low. And again, the reason that the white blood cell count goes low is because the chemotherapy affects rapidly growing cells, which are the white blood cell precursors in the bone marrow. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a, a brief thing, looking at low um, white blood cell count, um, people would get, if it's low enough, generally normal white blood cell count is about 4,000 or above. If it's below 1,000, people may get an infection, and that would be characterized by fever, chills, or sweating. If the red blood cells are low, people are anemic, they may be fatigued, they could be dizzy, they could have shortness of breath. And as I said before, if the platelets are low, people may be prone uh, to bleeding or, or bruisability. Next slide, please. So about 25 years ago, a medicine was developed called a growth factor. And the first growth factor was called Nubogen. And this is a drug that's a growth factor or a stimulant to the white blood cell precursors in the bone marrow. And once this drug was developed, we were able to just really revolutionize the use of chemotherapy, particularly for the drugs that cause low white blood cell count, because we were able to give this drug and reduce the amount of time that people's blood counts were low and really prevented people from getting an infection. Um, it's a little hard to explain this graph, but if you look where the placebo line is, you can see that people's low blood count, white blood cell counts are low from the eighth day after the chemotherapy up to about the 16th day after the chemotherapy. So people had a long, prolonged period of time where the white blood cell counts were low, and that's what actually led to an increased risk of getting an infection. But when people were given Nupogen, 
Um, the white blood cell count only went low for three or so days. So it minimized the time the white blood cell count was low. And this led to the prevention of a significant infection in the overwhelming majority of people. So this revolutionized chemotherapy and really served to prevent people from requiring admission after treatment and also allow us to give much higher doses of chemotherapy, hopefully to get better responses. Um, we still use Neupogen frequently. There's now a long acting form of Neupogen called Neulasta. Uh, next slide, please. Another side effect of certain chemotherapy drugs would be to affect the heart. This is a rare complication. But if, and that's called cardiotoxicity. And this does not cause a heart attack. It doesn't cause um, arrhythmias for the most part. What it, certain chemotherapy drugs can do can actually make the heart muscle beat less strongly. And if that happens, you have people can have shortness of breath. They can have some chest discomfort. They can get some palpitations. They can get fluid retention. And it's hard to read the bottom part of the slide, but this is seen mainly with certain chemotherapy drugs. Um, and the most common one is called adriamycin, and that's an anthracycline. We also see that with a drug called 5-FU, which is used commonly for breast cancer and colon cancer. Um, and it, then the drug after that is called cytoxin or cyclophosphamide, and that's a common drug as well. Next slide, please. But this is a rare complication, and it's seen mainly with the adriamycin drug, which is used mainly for breast cancer and Hodgkin's disease and lymphoma. And what this graph shows is that you generally need to get a fair amount of anthracycline or adriamycin before this even occurs. And it doesn't occur until people have been on this drug for about a minimum of six to 10 months. And it's based on the um, accumulative dose they've gotten um, with multiple treatments. So we know that as long as people are getting less than a certain amount or a certain cumulative dose, that this is a rare occurrence. So since we know this, we generally try to give less than that cumulative amount. And we follow patients by doing echocardiograms, which is a way that we can measure um, the pumping ability of the heart. Um, and we can avoid this complication again in almost everybody. So again, this is a rare complication. Um, next slide, please. We can also minimize the side effect by changing the type of drug we're giving. So it says conventional doxorubicin, that's traditional um, adriamycin. But we have a new form of adriamycin called doxel, which is pegylated liposomal doxorubicin. And this is where the chemotherapy molecule is wrapped in a little fatty membrane microscopically. So the drug goes exactly where we want it to go intravenously. And when we fo formed a different um, formulation of the same drug, it's almost unheard of to get this complication. So that's one way we deal with complications of a drug by forming a, creating a new form that hopefully won't cause the same side effect. Uh, next slide, please. Um, other complications that we frequently get are constipation, and that is not so much from the chemotherapy drug, but it's seen more from the anti-nausea drugs, particularly Zofan or drugs like that. People also can be less active when they're in chemotherapy. They could be a little nauseous, or they may not be getting enough fluid in. Their diet may change, and all of these things can lead to constipation. And again, we grade this as we did with nausea with grade one, two, three, and four, going from less severe to more severe. And these problems are usually very well managed by giving, next slide please, um, a whole list of anti-constipation um, medicines, ranging from fiber medicines in the first box, um, such as um, um, Senecat or Metamucil, to giving stool softeners such as Colace in the next box, or giving drugs such as um, Merrillax um, or laxatives if we need them. Next slide, please. People can also get diarrhea from chemotherapy. Um, and this is um, seen fairly commonly with certain drugs such as 5-fluorouracil or oral zolota. Again, not all chemotherapy drugs do that. And we can try to minimize that by telling patients um, to minimize um, dairy products. People frequently are lactase intolerant. 
minimize spicy foods, minimize alcohol, caffeine products, um, and um, and we can treat that quite successfully, usually with drugs like Imodium or a prescription medicine called Lamotil. Um, and sometimes medicines like Metamucil, which is actually used frequently as a laxative or a stool softener, can also help treat diarrhea caused by chemotherapy. Um, and again, traditional medicines such as kaopectate um, can also help that. Next slide, please. Another complication that people frequently are quite upset about is losing their hair. And again, not all chemotherapy drugs cause hair loss, um, but many of them do. The medical word for hair loss is alopecia. And if people are getting hair loss or alopecia from chemotherapy, it generally occurs about 14 to 20 days after the first treatment. And it generally grows back normally once the chemotherapy is finished, it will start, your hair will start growing again about three to four weeks after the last chemotherapy drugs, and it will grow back slowly. But in 99% of patients, people's hair grows back normally. So one way we can try to minimize this is something called a cooling cap. And the way a cool, an ice cap or a cooling cap works is by when you put the way that chemotherapy causes hair loss, again, is by affecting the rapidly growing cells in the hair follicle. If you can put an ice cap on your head, the blood vessels constrict from the cold. Like when you go outside in cold weather, your hands turn white because less blood is flowing to your hands. And if less blood is flowing to your scalp because you're cooling it, therefore less chemotherapy will go to your scalp. And if less chemotherapy is going to your scalp, less hair follicle will be affected and people generally lose less hair. Um, the theoretical risk of doing this is if less chemotherapy is going to your scalp, you may be creating a sanctuary where less chemotherapy is going to kill any microscopic cancer cells that may be in that area. And that's always been a big concern over the years, but most of the studies have shown that, that using the cooling cap does not lead to an increased incidence of recurrence in the scalp. The cooling cap is also fairly um, uncomfortable and it's not covered by insurance. Um, so it's something that has to be purchased by the patient, but it is available and we do have it in our offices. And if people would want it, we certainly can do that. Um, it's not perfect, but it does help as seen on the next slide. Um, well, actually, um, I'll get to that in a second, but this is actually a list of the drugs that cause hair loss. Um, and severe hair loss is seen mainly by the adriamycin drugs that I've already spoken about um, in terms of um, the heart and low blood counts. But adriamycin, doxorubicin, the taxane, such as taxol, the taxotere, cytoxin does. And then there are drugs that infrequently cause hair loss, such as vincristine, and then many drugs such as 5-FUZOLOTA um, and um, um, cisplatin or carboplatin generally do not cause hair loss. The main concern is um, generally adriamycin or the taxanes. Next slide, please. So this is a slide from the company that makes the cooling cap, but it says that if you're getting adriamycin um, with the cooling cap, 56% of patients are likely to retain at least half of their hair. So about half the patients will retain half their hair. So this is certainly a benefit. It may prevent the need for a um, someone purchasing a wig, um, but most people still will lose some hair, but it certainly is an improvement compared to not doing that. Um, next slide, please. I'm running low on time, so I'm just gonna go quickly through the next slide or two. Um, People frequently get mouth sores and mucositis, and we can generally minimize that by using certain mouthwashes. Um, people sometimes will get a minimal uh, mucositis or mouth sore, and then it can get super infected with a fungal infection, and that's called thrush or yeast infection. So we frequently treat these mucositises with mouth rinses, baking soda and water, salt water, or a liquid or an antibiotic um, to kill the yeast infection uh, called um, mycostatin. Um, the bottom part, very rarely people can have an allergic reaction to chemotherapy, and that particularly happens with drugs such as Taxol or Taxane. Um, usually those allergic reactions happen in the office, not when you leave, and we can prevent those reactions in almost everybody and treat it successfully with steroids or Benadryl. 
and that's a rare occurrence. Um, next slide, please. And again, not only do we treat the side effects of all of these drugs with the medicines I've spoken about before, but other non-medical treatments frequently can help, um, such as um, vitamins. People think vitamin E can sometimes help some of these side effects. Um, taking calcium, other vitamins, acupuncture, aromatherapy, um, biofeedback, behavioral therapy, exercise, meditation, all of these things do help. Again, it's not part of the standard medical treatment, um, but it's certainly things that are beneficial to many patients, and all these treatments are available as well. Um, next slide, please. I think I'm just going to go on for about another four or five minutes and then open it to questions. And I wanted to talk briefly about hormonal treatment for breast cancer. Not all breast cancers are fueled, not all cancers are fueled by hormones, but many cancers do are fueled by hormones and, and can benefit from hormonal treatment. And the main cancers that are, are hormonally driven are breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and uterine cancer in women. Not all breast cancer is hormonally driven, but many are, and in men, prostate cancer. So because of this fact, we can frequently treat these cancers with hormonal type treatments, frequently not hormones, but hormonal type treatments. So next slide, please. So in breast cancer in particular, many breast cancers are what we call estrogen dependent or estrogen positive. So we can treat those cancers by giving pills that block the attachment of estrogen to the cancer cells. And those cancer cells that are estrogen dependent need estrogen in order to grow. Um, and the drugs that block the attachment of estrogen on these cells are tamoxifen. That's the most common drug, a drug called Faristan, and then an injectable hormone called um, Fosalidex or Fulvestrant. Um, these are generally very well tolerated drugs, generally pills, except for the last one, it's an injection. And people can get side effects from these drugs. They can get hot flashes. Um, they can get some um, rare incidents of blood clots and, and things like that. But for the most part, these hormonal treatments, and again, these are really anti-hormonal treatments, um, have much less side effects than chemotherapy. Next slide, please. There are certain um, also estrogen um, dependent breast cancers that we can treat not with drugs that block the attachment of hormones, but prevent the production of hormones. And these are drugs that we get generally give to women who are postmenopausal, who are not making hormones or estrogen in their ovaries anymore, but are still making a small amount of estrogen in the fatty tissues in the body. And these drugs are called aromatase inhibitors. And the three drugs we use are anastrozole, aromacin, or letrozole, or femara. And these drugs are for postmenopausal women and also pills with minimal side effects. Uh, next slide, please. And the side effects that people generally get would be, could be nausea, which is rare, weight gain, a few pounds, particularly with tamoxifen and fatigue, um, hair loss, very, very rarely, nothing compared to chemotherapy, mouth sores, really not at all. Um, some women can get depression. About 1% or 2% of people can have some emotional ability. Um, people sometimes say that they just aren't thinking clearly. They're a little foggy on the medicine, but again, usually minimal compared to chemotherapy. But the main side effects of these hormonal therapies are aches and pains, particularly in, with the aromatase inhibitors, and about 20% of people complain of some aches and pains in the smaller joints. Um, and also some hot flashes. Next slide, please. Um, this is the same talking about some hot flashes. Occasionally when we get some vaginal discharge, some fatigue, um, very, very rarely, and I really emphasize the word rarely with drugs like tamoxifen, there's a rare risk of blood clots. It's about one in a thousand, very, very uncommon. Tamoxifen can very, very rarely lead to an increased risk of uterine cancer, also about one in a thousand. Um, we do see some increased osteoporosis in women taking the aromatase inhibitors. This is usually very predictable um, and um, preventable by giving um, supplementation with calcium, vitamin D, and if needed, prescription medicines such as Fosamax, Boniva, 
um, or prolia. Um, and we generally follow women getting the aromatase inhibitors with bone density studies every few years. Um, next slide, please. Men can also be treated with, with who have prostate cancer with hormonal therapy. Um, years ago, we would treat men with prostate cancer with orchiectomy, meaning removing the testicles, which remove the production, production of testosterone. That worked well, but obviously most people do not want to have their testicles removed. We can use estrogen replacement, a drug called DES, and that was stopped years ago, even though it worked well, because giving men estrogen replacement with DS led to an increased risk of heart disease, so that's no longer given. But we now give medicines that are listed on this slide. Um, actually, the next slide I want to go to, please. Um, um, and um, I, I guess it's not on there, but the, slide, this, the drugs that we would want to use is a drug called Lupron. And Lupron is actually a drug that pre prevents the production of a hormone in the brain called LH, luteinizing hormone that stimulates the testicle to make testosterone. So Lupron actually shuts off the testicles without doing surgery and leads to a, a very high percentage response rate with metastatic prostate cancer. Main effects of Lupron are hot flashes and some fluid retention. Um, I had other things to go through, but it's really going to take up too much time. So I think at this point, I'm going to stop and um, leave it open for questions. And I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions that are put forward. Okay. Um, actually, Dr. Fine, is it okay if I advance to immunotherapy, if you could just cover a little bit of immunotherapy? Sure, I can do that. Okay. Okay. So let me move the slides forward. Okay. Okay, so the newer treatments that we're giving for many cancers now are immunotherapy. Um, we've actually been using some types of immunotherapy for years with various cancers, but this is really the newest form of treating cancers, and we're really getting terrific responses in many cancers, not all cancers, but many cancers. Um, and the main reason immunotherapy works is the way that our immune system works either to fight off an infection or fight off a cancer, is the immune system um, in general should recognize that a bacteria that's in your body or a virus that's in your body as being foreign, something that doesn't belong to you. And once it recognizes that infection, the immune system gets activated, activates the white blood cells and the, um, the, the immunoglobulin levels and fights off the, um, the infection. In general, though, when a cancer is formed, that cancer is you, it's me, it's all of us. So our body doesn't recognize that cancer cell as being foreign. It thinks that cancer cell belongs to the person who's developed the cancer. So the immune system doesn't activate to fight off that cancer. So immunotherapy that we're getting now are new ways of activating the immune system to to allow the immune system to recognize those cancer cells being for what it is, is something that shouldn't be there and fight it off. And the most common immunotherapy we're using now is something called a checkpoint inhibitor. And a checkpoint inhibitor is where the cancer cells, um, where the, the drug, the, the, immuno, the, the uh, checkpoint inhibitor unmasks the chemotherapy cell, uh, unmasks the cancer cell um, here, and generally by affecting something called the PDL1 or the PD1 receptor, and allows the body's own immune system to recognize that cancer and fight it off. Uh, next slide, please. And the main immunotherapy drugs that we're using that are checkpoint inhibitors are the drug called Optivo. That was the first one, and that's also hard to say, but nivo, Nivolumumab or Keytruda to Centric or Mphimsy. Those are the main drugs that we're using now as well as a drug called Yervoy. And these are all checkpoint inhibitors that we give that basically serve to unmask the cancer cell so the body's own immune system can fight it off. These are not chemotherapy drugs and most people have minimal side effects from these drugs. Next slide. 
Sometimes people get some fatigue, they can get some nausea and vomiting, but for the most part, we see really very, very few of any side effects. Side effects that we can see could be a rash, sometimes some diarrhea. Um, and the reason we get side effects is because the immune system gets activated and sometimes gets activated too well. So basically the side effects that we see from immunotherapy are basically signs of inflammation in the body. You know, generally a rash isn't too bad, some um, diarrhea isn't too bad, and we can continue with the drug. But sometimes the reaction can be very severe, um, requiring more treatment. Um, and the side effects that can be severe could be, again, severe diarrhea leading to dehydration. It could be severe rash causing, um, you know, bleeding or, or things like that from the skin. But if we see an inflammation in the lungs, we call that a pneumonitis, people can have significant shortness of breath. Sometimes it could affect the heart. Sometimes it could affect the kidneys and your problem with your kidney function or your bowels where you're getting a lot of diarrhea. People can also have nervous system inflammation where they can have confusion or seizures. All of those side effects are very, very rare. Um, and generally they're treated well by stopping the immunotherapy drug and treating with steroids, which suppress the immune system. Um, but sometimes that effect of treating the cancer from the immunotherapy can continue for a long period of time, even after immunotherapy is, drug has been stopped. I had a patient a few years ago who developed um, who had kidney cancer, had one treatment with the checkpoint inhibitor Opdivo, and he developed severe inflammation of his nerves and muscles after one treatment and had terrible, terrible muscle and bone pain. It was a side effect of the drug. So I stopped the Opdivo after one treatment, put him on steroids. The side effects basically went away and his cancer went into remission for about a year and a half from one treatment. Normally we would have continued that treatment every two weeks, but he was in remission for a year and a half after one treatment. Um, and eventually he progressed and we treated him with different treatments at that point. But that Updevo allowed his immune system to continue to fight off that cancer you know, for well over one year. Um, so let me see if I have anything else that I want to go through quickly. No, that, that's it. So I'm, I'm gonna stop here. Great, thank you. Um, so at this time, we'll open up for questions. If you have any questions, you could type them into the chat box. And as a reminder, Dr. Fine isn't able to offer medical advice to attendees. Um, and so there was a there were a couple questions that had been emailed in advance. Uh, one of them is: I understand uh, paresthesia in the toes and foot can be a side effect of chemotherapy. Is it progressive? Um, generally, once we stop the chemotherapy, those effects will improve. It doesn't improve right away. It can take weeks and months and even many months to um, improve. But generally, once we stop the chemotherapy over time, those side effects will minimize to the point where it, people do not complain about it much. But yes, if people do develop side effects and paresthesia neuropathy from a drug, we generally will either stop that drug or give it less often or reduce the dose because those effects can be cumulative. Okay. And then how long after chemotherapy does neuropathy last? And are there any recommendations for treatment medically or holistically? Is there any um, immediate relief for the intense pain when it happens? Again, neuropathy just usually doesn't develop right away. It doesn't usually happen after one treatment. It generally takes multiple treatments where that develops. So it's a gradual thing that develops and people begin to complain of some numbness and tingling in their fingertips or toes, and that can progress to pain, difficulty buttoning your shirt. Um, the best way to treat that and immediately is with pain medication, your Tylenol, Advil, you know, even opioids if we need to. Um, certain medicines are felt to help that, such as vitamin therapy, um, the B-complex vitamins, B12, um, exercise. Um, some people feel acupuncture can help, but generally the best way to treat that is to stop the drug and give time, and it does improve in general as time goes on. Thank you. And then um, is bowel blockage a side effect of GI cancer, and what preventative measures can be taken to minimize the chance of this occurring? Bowel blockage? Yes, bowel blockage. Well, I mean, bowel blockage is certainly a, is a, um, a complication of having an intestinal colon cancer. 
So if someone has a, a colon cancer um, that is left untreated or diagnosed being large, it can certainly cause a bowel blockage. And that's a medical emergency, surgical emergency. People need to be admitted. Um, you know, they need to have surgery done if the cancer is causing that blockage. You can also get a blockage, not because of the cancer directly, but because of scar tissue. Um, that sometimes resolves with um, intravenous fluids and just letting your bowels rest. Um, uh, constipation, severe constipation is called obstipation. That could lead to bowel blockage. And that usually gets better with laxatives, some IV fluids, and sometimes requires hospitalization. Um, chemotherapy and does not cause bowel blockage. It can cause severe constipation, but chemotherapy would not cause bowel blockage. Okay. And can immunotherapy be used for uh, stage one breast cancer instead of hormone therapy? The, the answer is nowadays, no. Um, so far, the immunotherapy drugs um, work well for many cancers, but the only breast cancers that have been shown to be a um, um, respond to immunotherapy or people who have what's called a triple negative breast cancer and only advanced stage. So we don't use immunotherapy for any early stage breast cancers. Okay. And can chemo cause skin dermatitis? Yes. Um, dermatitis by causing an inflammation and infection, um, a rash, and that could certainly cause some type of um, dermatitis. And that's usually treated well with um, local um, steroid creams um, and, and um, you know, even lotions can usually treat that quite well. Okay. And then one more question. Is there a treatment for long-term neuropathy after chemo has been completed? Well, gen again, as I said before, generally the neuropathy will get better as time goes on. It doesn't get better in a week or a month, but six months after the treatment's done, people's neuropathy is much less than it was at that time. And six months later, it's much less. And I generally find in 99% of people within a year or so, they don't really think about the neuropathy. It's not much of a problem unless they think about it. Um, but the long-term treatment would be vitamins, um, physical therapy may help, exercise, and just generally eating well. And it generally dissipates to the point of insignificance in most people over many, many months. So I think that's it for questions. All right, so thank you, Dr. Fine, for taking the time to present on this topic and for answering all of our questions. And then uh, for everyone who's joined us, thank you for joining us and please join us for li the library's other upcoming health program, Asthma, Finding the Ease in Your Wheeze, on Friday, June 25th at 12 p.m. And for more information or to register, check the library's event page at ebpl.org slash calendar. And thank you everyone for joining us for today's talk. Take care and stay safe. Okay, thank you very much. I right, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for joining us for this week's Encore presentation. To join us for live programs or to learn more about the East Brunswick Public Library, visit our website at eb